Let's see, is that all the mesons? I guess that's all the mesons I need to introduce. So there's one more meson that I kind of skipped through the first time around, and I really need that in my list to, to complete uh, what I'm going to call meson octet, and that's uh, this ADA meson. Um, it's, uh, I guess, a lot of property-wise, it's very similar to pi meson, uh, neutral pi meson, it's neutral. Um, the only difference being it's heavier for some reason, but let me keep that in the list. So you have the pi mesons, and then um, you have eta meson, which uh, is heavier than pi meson, but otherwise quite similar to pi mesons. So what's just starting to set this apart are the fact that they are, um, I don't know. So let's see. So they are longer lived. At least when you compare the neutral version to the neutral version. And I guess um, you, I can actually kind of try to explain why this is longer lived. And I think I can introduce the necessary idea in the context of the pion. Because this is an idea that's going to become very, um, I don't know, it's a common theme in particle physics. So when you look at the pion, I, oh wait, this was the pion. When you look at the pion, uh, I kind of you know, um, skipped through this without bringing your attention to it. Um, so both the charged pion and the neutral pion, they seem very similar, right? They, um, um, they have about the same mass, um, 135, 140 MeV, that seems like about the same. But for some reason, their lifetime is different by like a factor of 100. Uh, the charged pion is much more longer lived. Well, okay, not 100. I don't know why I keep thinking this lives only for 10 to minus 7. It lives for 10 to minus 17. So um, the charged pion lives like, uh, I don't know, billion times longer than the, the uncharged version. Um, but somehow um, people, so if we had to explain why the, or sorry, not if you had to explain, let me try to explain why that, uh, would be, why that could be the case and why, um, why that's not all that surprising. So, so when people discover these particles, one of the ways they kind of measure their properties, figure out what's going on with them is by observing their decay. Because these are all unstable particles. So you look at, well, what are they turning into? You look at the charged pions, they turn into muons and neutrinos. And when they look at the neutral pion, it turns into photons. So these are the kind of decay interactions that they see. And let's just, and when you consult this chart, you see that that's the main decay mode. So pi naught, 99% of the time, it decays into two photons. So the common way a neutral pion would decay is into two photons. Good. And a common way, the most common way charged pion decays is into muon. It also can decay into electron, but only a very small fraction. So 99.99% of the time, um, a charged pion would decay into muon, or rather anti-muon and muon, and a muon neutrino. Right? So this kind of gives you a hint of the different kind of interactions that are involved. Because when you look at the decay of the um, neutral pion, then what you would see is that the decay products are photons, right? Whenever photons are involved, what kind of interaction are you looking at? Like what's the force that's involved in the decay or the reaction process? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic, yes. Yeah, so that's why we call photon the uh, one of the force bosons, the mediating force mediators, and the force it mediates is electromagnetic. So photons being here means you are dealing with electromagnetic phenomena. I don't see any photon here. Instead, I see a neutrino, 
what does that mean for what kind of interaction is involved in kind of determining the process that's happening here? What other interaction is a neutrino involved in? Sorry? Strong interaction? Do you remember any other decay process that neutrino was involved in? Someone other than Gauger? Beta decay, right? Yeah. Uh, so you saw neutrino in the context of beta decay. And what beta decay is, um, the interaction that mediates beta decay, we call that weak interaction. So the presence of neutrino means there must be weak interaction involved there somehow. Because it's the weak interaction that produces neutrinos. So if you have a neutrino that in fact, the neutrino is very useful for the purpose. It interacts, I guess it interacts only two, pos two ways. It can interact by weak interaction. That's where it was introduced. And we assume <laughs> it interacts gravitationally. And that's it. It doesn't, inter it doesn't participate in any electromagnetic force because it's neutral. And it doesn't participate in any strong nuclear interaction um, as far as we know. So this being involved means that there's a weak interaction involved somehow. And you can, once you kind of accept this, that somehow neutral pion decay happens by electromagnetic interaction, and charged pion decay happens by weak interaction, then you can kind of come to a piece about why this is so much longer lived compared to the decay that happens by electromagnetic interaction. Because weak interaction, as the name suggests, it's weaker. So um, it's like, you know, if I'm trying to move, uh, I don't know what a good example is. Um, oh, I guess <laughs> this is an example that I can actually do. Um, if I'm trying to um, shake this by my hand shaking with the force of the string, then you know, it would shake very quickly, right? What if, we, if I was make, trying to make it swing by just blowing on it? And I can actually kind of do it, as long as I do it on resonance. But because you know, air is much weaker, so it takes longer. <laughs> and it's kind of the same principle here. Weak interaction is the weaker force, so it, um, the kind of decays that are happening through weak interaction happens more slowly.